November 9th, 2023, Hadley Climate Change Committee meeting, 7 o'clock, call to order. All right, the first, uh, the second thing on the agenda is Dr. Moser's letter of rec uh, resignation, and she has asked us to read it. So dated October 16th, 2023, dear Jack, Kathy, members of the Hadley Climate Change Committee and frequently attending members of the public. I have recently become aware of the challenging situation I have contributed to at the last meeting I attended in August 2023. While I'm on travel, I am writing to tell, uh, I'm writing to you to address this issue. Please feel free to enter the letter into the official meeting minutes and Marion later on, I'll pass you this okay, sure. First, I want to apologize for my choice of language that has offended members of the public who attended it that August meeting. I did not intend to cause anyone harm in my defense of well-established scientific facts and in guarding the truth of what I actually said when words to the contrary were put into my mouth. I say this not as an excuse, but just as an explanation. I apologize for offending anyone with my words, and I'm sorry for not being better able to control my emotions. To be clear, I am not apologizing for standing up for science or defending my truth, but I am sorry in the way I did it. I'm also very sorry for the challenges and delays this has created for the committee. I joined it a couple of years ago to help bring my professional expertise to bear on Hadley's efforts to mitigate its share of heat trapping emissions and its more recent efforts in preparing for and adapting to the inevitable impacts of climate change that we are now experiencing. The last thing I want is to cause any delays or obstacles for the committee to continue its important work given the speed of climate change. Um, and Hadley and everyone else in the world being so far behind with both mitigation and adaptation. So I hope that my apology to those who were offended go a long way toward calming down the situation so you can get back to the critical work at hand. The second and related reason for writing is that I want this letter to serve as my official notice of resignation from the committee. I have come to the conviction that my presence on the committee will be more problematic than helpful going forward, given this recent incident and its lasting impacts. I have dedicated my life to preserving the conditions for life on Earth. Work on this committee is just one of the ways in which I have tried to do that. I have other ways to help out Hadley if needed or useful and to work across the Pioneer Valley and Massachusetts as well as more broadly across the Northeast, the US and internationally. So I will direct my energies there, but I do not want this to be the cause for you not to be able to move forward effectively with your work on behalf of all Hadley residents. I have learned a lot during my time on the committee and I'm glad to get to know each of you. I appreciate the hard work of the committee and what everyone brings to it. Thank you for your dedication and time, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Sincerely, Dr. Susie Moser. Mary, no, no taker for tonight. Okay. Yeah. We Before we get into the code of conduct, the question came up last time about um, it was held up and someone asked me and it was public comment so I couldn't reply but they were asking me if I had gotten a code of conduct on Thursday August 17th I received this email from Jennifer Sanders James um, the select board recently adopted a code of conduct uh, guidelines for town boards commissions committees and the town of Hadley um, committee handbook the select board asks you to review these and adopt the code of conduct. And it goes on and it gives more information. We were given a, a deadline of December, but before the end of the year. I've had a chance to sign it. I've signed mine. I okay. turned it in. You've signed it? Yeah, I went to to. I have not signed hall. it yet. I'm happy yeah. to sign it this right. evening. Yeah. Well, you were going to have me read it. Absolutely. And later on, Michael, if you can do this, and then at some point, if you drop that off with Jennifer sure. in the office. I think Marion needs one too. Okay, I, I did sign something, but I guess it was You just gave me the final page. I'm going to need You know, and no, and the final page is all Jennifer asks us to sign. Okay, but if you wanted me to read. Yeah, something. I have those for you. Oh, here, I have it. Okay, okay great. Okay. Well, mine's got writing on it. I don't care, I'll give it back to you. Let me see. 
<coughs> and whenever you're ready. And oh, and, um, I do want people to remember that our August meeting was on August 10th. So we got this after that. So, I don't think that's so Michael, whenever you're ready. Okay, so I've been asked to, uh, since we're all sign signing this document, just quickly reviewing it, and um, and then I was going to go to the public participation, some guidelines as well from the Open Public Meeting Guidebook. Um, these guidelines serve as the standard for achieving, maintaining a high level of public confidence, trust and, trust and professional respect with regard to how the town of Hadley and its officials conduct business. They're intended to define and create a centralized understanding with regard to standards of conduct. Um, applicability, these guidelines apply to the select board and to all other town boards, commissions and committees, which is us. And all members of the uh, select board and all other individuals listed above uh, assume the following obligations and commitments. Um, I'm going to read a few of these, especially the ones that have been raised um, in public comment to make sure it's clear that we're paying attention to these things and going to try to uh, put our best foot forward going forward. Uh, stay informed about local and state duties uh, of a board uh, or committee member. Remember that you represent the town at all times. Accept your position as a means of unselfish public service and do not attempt to benefit personally, professionally, or financially from your position. Recognize that the chief function of local government at all times is to serve the best interests of all the people. Demonstrate respect for the public that you serve. Safeguard all confidential information and seek no favors and understand that personal aggrandizement or profit secured by holding these positions is often dishonest and may be unlawful. Um, conduct. There's more on the back page. Yeah. Okay. Conduct yourself so as to minimize, uh, so as to maintain public confidence in our local <coughs> government. Um, and I'm not going to do every read everything here. As I said, just going to try to focus on the ones that have been raised that we're going to pay special attention to. Treat all staff as professions, professionals and respect the abilities, experience, and dignity of each. Direct questions about town staff or requests for additional background information to town administrator. Avoid publicly criticizing an individual, employee, or department. Only raise concerns about staff performance in the town. So these are things that affect the select board more than us. The chair of the public body is responsible for conducting all public meetings in an orderly and peaceable manner. The public body may allow a public comment session during the open session of a public meeting, and if public comments are posted on a meeting agenda, the session will last for no more than 15 minutes. Each speaker during the public comment session shall be limited to a maximum of three minutes. Members of the public may speak only with the permission of the chair to maintain an orderly and peaceable meeting all speakers must identify themselves by name and address prior to speaking. Uh, all persons addressing the public body must conduct themselves in a peaceable and orderly manner. And that is about it. And since, every, since I'm the last person to sign this document, I will do that this evening. And, um, and then I've also been asked to uh, read the uh, public participation in meetings laws, um, what is exactly a law allowed, and, and this is from the Open Meeting Law Guide. Under the Open Meeting Law, the public is permitted to attend meetings of public bodies, but is excluded from an executive session that is called for a valid purpose. While the public is permitted to attend an open meeting, an individual may not address the public body without permission of the chair. An individual may not disrupt a meeting of a public body, and at the request of the chair, all members of the public shall be silent. If after clear warning a person continues to be disruptive, the chair may order the person to leave the meeting. If the person does not leave, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person. Although public participation is entirely within the chair's discretion, the Attorney General encourages public bodies to allow as much public participation as time permits. You don't need to say much. Any member of the public may make a video or uh, audio recording of an open session of a public meeting and a, a member of the public who wishes to record a meeting must first notify the chair and must comply with reasonable requirements regarding audio and visual. 
The chair is required to inform other attendees of any such recording at the beginning of the meeting. So those are those documents. Okay. Thank you. So you're next up, Randy. Okay. Uh, my name is Randy Eiser. I live at 2 Armview Drive. I've been asked by Jack to, I'm a member of the select board, but I'm not here speaking uh, for the select board. I'm here as a private citizen. Uh, Jack asked me to just talk about meeting best practices, and I am not an expert, but I am more than happy to share what I know, and what I think, and you folks can take it from there. So, Mr. Doctor has hit on some of the points that I was going to talk about, but this just part would be good. A, a big thing that in this town and most towns throughout the state, when people get on a committee or a board, there is little to no training for you. And that goes for this board, the select board, anything that I've seen in, in town. As a matter of fact, there was something in the paper Monday, uh, Beacon Hill roll call, which is the stuff that's happening in the state house. And one of the bills was to provide money for towns for training for board and committee members. So I thought that was pretty appropriate for the time. So your meetings are required by state law to be open to the public, as Michael said, and comply with open meeting law. So Michael talked about the code of conduct. And you folks, as committee members, and anybody else in town on a board or committee has to sign that, which says you're going to behave in a particular way. You alluded to the fact that the public has to behave in a reasonable, responsible way. They don't have to sign anything. So to what Michael read, the chair of the board or committee is responsible to keep people in line if things get out of control. And I know there's been some contentious meetings with this committee. Um, your, you have meetings to conduct the, the business of your committee. Your, your, your meetings are not to appease the public. You do your, your committee work. The public has to be allowed here. You, you may or may not allow them to speak. It's at the chair's discretion. I agree with the Attorney General that people should be allowed to speak. Um, if somebody speaks during public comment, you cannot act on that at that time it, because it is not on your agenda. So if somebody brings up something in the public comment that you feel is worthy of further discussion, you need to put it on a, an agenda for a following meeting. Um, I looked at how you folks are running your meetings and this, you have co-chair. Mm -hmm. And I think from my perspective it would make sense if one of you ran a particular meeting, not, the book, not go back and forth, because it's easier to keep track of who's in charge. Okay. So whether you go every other meeting or whatever, however you decide to do it, it just, to me, it, I think it'll keep things in check better. Okay. Um, and if you have discussions where you've got, you know, Kathy, you could be having a discussion over here, Jack could be having a discussion over there because, hey, I'm the chair, I'm the chair, but that, that gets yeah, things yeah. out of control. So try to keep that in, in perspective there. Um, let's see, you, I looked at your agendas and from as many back as I could, and they're kind of all over the place. There's no consistency to the order of them, and I think it would make sense to, to have order, s similar items from month to month or meeting to meeting, uh, not only for you folks, but for the people that, the public that comes, if they look at your agenda and say, okay, I'm concerned with this item and it's going to happen, item number four, then they know they don't have to be here at 7 o'clock if right. they don't want to be. Okay. Um, uh, because of the contentious stuff, uh, this is this is for the board and for the 
the public. So public comment at a meeting is not mandated by the state. It is a right, not a privilege, for public to speak. Again, I believe it's appropriate to allow them to speak, but they just they need to be respectful just like the board needs to be respectful to them. And lastly, again because of the contentiousness of, <coughs> of this, the name, maybe it's the name of the committee, whatever it is, there are people that disagree with you wholeheartedly and they're entitled to that. So you guys, the board, committee needs to understand that everybody, whether it's you or us out here, have our own truths and that's what we believe in. And you can't try to force me to think what your thoughts are and vice versa. And you, you, you do what you believe in in a way that, you know, re react to people with respect. And ultimately, Arguing is going to get nobody anywhere but mad at each other. So those are the highlights of what I have to offer. If anybody wants to discuss it further, I'd be happy to ask, answer questions or whatever you want to do. And that was very helpful. Well, I hope so. And, you know, there, there's always places to get help if you feel like you need it. Call the town administrator, talk to her. There's lots of stuff online that the state provides. Um, I mean, you kind of, you got to do some homework. Uh, I've been. Yeah. And there's a webinar, I think it's next week, that uh, the municipal, I don't know, MMA is putting on about how to run a good meeting. It's in the middle of the day, so I think I'm probably the only one that, from us that can go, but I'm going to do it. And, and you really have to have tough skin. I, I ref high school soccer for 10 years, so <laughs> if you don't have tough skin, you can't do that job. And but but I also needed to prepare myself. Every year I read the rule book, and there it never changed. But I, I always read it. If I had a game where I questioned something, I would go look at it in the rule book because I want to be confident in what I'm in my decision making. Yeah. Just like you folks need to be when you're dealing with each other, when you're dealing with the public. Okay. So Randy, from how you understand this committee originally being formed, we're an advisory committee to the select board. I don't know if you have any other insights on that. I mean, this is different. We're not the planning board. We're not the zoning board. We're not elected to this. We are appointed to these positions. Um, do you have any other thoughts on sort of our space? Well, I think that what you've been doing is digging up information, trying to find a way that it makes sense for the town to utilize it for particularly energy savings. And you, you, you're right, you have no authority to say this is the way it's going to be. You are advising and hope that people understand where, what you're saying and that it makes sense. So uh, for if there's anybody out in this room, out in, in the town, that thinks you're any, you have the ability to make policy for the town, they're very wrong. You can help offer suggestions, but you don't have the authority to make policy. Okay. And you know, we were thrilled to become a green community. It's sad that Hadley was the second to the last town in New Hampshire oh, wow. County to become green. We're ahead of South Hadley, but um, we made it mm -hmm. this year, yeah. and that's $140,000 that can be used toward other expenses to reduce the cost of municipal utilities and everything else. That's a big, big gain for us. It is. And we hope to have more gains in the future. And that $140,000 would not have happened if it wasn't for this committee that I will assure you of. Okay. All right, are we done? Yeah. Okay. So next is approve all our past minutes. So no, no. public comment. Oh, sorry, public comment. Don't forget. <laughs> sorry. I skipped it.
Susan? Yes. Um, Do you know I what we need? Name not name everybody Susan. knows your name, so. My name is Susan Melton. Okay. And, and your address? Uh, I have two addresses. Uh, 36 Knightley Road and 6 Wind Path West. Okay, thanks. Um, I am relieved that this committee has finally signed off on the Code of Conduct. Uh, since you had not adopted Robert's rules, there had to be some rules. And so, uh, from a public perspective, thank you. You appear more transparent by signing off on the Code of Conduct. Um, second of all, I recently attended a select board meeting, and I liked their format of making a presentation, and they allowed the public to ask questions, and they answered those questions at that very same meeting. It uh, kept the feeling of being deceived uh, out of the picture because you immediately got an answer to their questions. They were not rude to the public. They d did not use any profanity toward the public, even though the public did not agree with all they had to say. I would ask that you consider that same format of making your presentation and allowing the public to ask questions and you answer those questions during that very same meeting and mirror the format of the select board meeting. Because as far as I could tell, the public, although they may not have agreed, they felt satisfied that they were provided with immediate answers. Versus your new format is asking that we wait another 30 days until the very next meeting to receive answers to our questions. And to me, that is wrong. That is simply wrong. Randy uh, used the term uh, public confidence. Um, I believe that you would further, thank you, uh, further public confidence in your committee by allowing them to ask questions, particularly if you're gonna be making decisions that will affect their lives. That although you may not direct policy as an advisory board, you sure have a lot of influence on policy that's being made. That's why you were created, I assume. So if you do have this power to mandate public policy, you should give the public the respect to at least answer their questions posed to you at that very same meeting. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Thomas Phil, 38 Newton Lane. In reference to audience participation, I'll just say a tradesman that's been doing HVAC work for 30 years, it was more about BTUs and heating and cooling efficiency than a Boston politician. So maybe it's, uh, that feedback would be useful. Uh, nuclear power, nuclear power did not work in this country in the 1960s. The power that was more expensive than gas, oil, or coal generated electricity. Plus there were hidden costs. Um, including enormous decommissioning costs, there are also higher cancer rates in the area of nuclear power plants, higher leukemia rates, including one of my nephews. Wow. Let's skip forward to 2050. The country is in utopia, 100% electricity for all heating, cooling, and transfer transportation needs. Instead of being dependent on three or four monopolies, we are dependent on one monopoly for our standard of living and basic human needs. There's zero competition for pricing. Then, during a cold snap, we could have an extended power outage, like the Halloween snowstorm approximately 15 years ago, and it could be fatal. The bottom line is question authority. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Your Hi. name? Uh, my name is Alan Drews. I um, work at 123 West Street in Hadley. I live at 46 Camp Road in Leverett. Um, uh, this is my first time attending this meeting, but I'm just here to express my support for this committee and my concern about climate change and my hope that um, Hadley can continue to be participating and um, investing in leadership on this issue. So. Um, I'm a vegetable farmer. I've been managing a farm in Hadley for four years, and before that I farmed in Amherst for three years, and before that I farmed other places, Minnesota, California, for years before that. 
Um, and in the seven years that I've been farming in the valley, I have worked through two record droughts, two record rainfall years, and I am changing my crop plan around new frost dates. I kind of think our traditional frost rate dates are a thing of the past. So um, it's something that I've experienced personally, and I went to a meeting in January of this past year at um, Plainville Farm in Hadley, where there were 50 plus farmers in attendance who were all very concerned about climate change adaptation. And it was a bustling, passionate meeting. It was very um, interesting to see who attended. It was across a wide range of farming spectrum, organic to conventional, to dairy, to vegetables, to grain and hay production. Um, and everyone was looking for more resources to adapt to extreme weather conditions, including money for irrigation supplies. Um, my farm uses no-till techniques, which are directly in response to climate um, extremes. So um, any support of reducing our emissions, which contribute to climate change, is great. And I also ask that we look into resources for um, climate adaptation for farmers, because that's a huge part of our community in this town, and um, businesses and residents as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so anybody else? Um, name? My name is Wally Sekaski. I live at 135 Mount Warner Road, and I'm Jack's brother. Um, I think Jack and I would probably agree that climate change is a fact. We've grown tobacco together for 40 years, and the season we work in now is not at all like when we started. It's a whole different world. A lot of people have had out of the last three years of growing tobacco, two crop failures, which is unheard of. Um, things are changing and not for the better. But here's where I differ from Jack. I really think climate change is caused by aliens. <laughs> um, no, they want us off of this earth. And the best way is for us to destroy our climate and our ecology. Just, we'll kill ourselves. And then they just come right in and take over. And I've got proof. A lot of people said the pyramids couldn't have been made by the Egyptian slaves because they're so huge. And don't you have to wonder, did they get help from the aliens? Most likely. And then internal combustion motors. Who, who came up with that idea? Possibly the aliens. Nuclear power, like Tom was talking about. It could have been a good thing. But who, who gave them the idea? got to wonder about this. So that's really all I have to say. That's my take on climate change. Thank you. There are no other public comments. I'd like to respond to one of them. I thought we weren't, we're not allowed to do that. Well, then I'd make a public comment. Just a general comment. Okay. The select who, who, board... Your address? Uh, Jane Nevin Smith, 16 Sunrise Drive, Hadley. The Climate Change Committee was appointed by the Select Board as an advisory board. They do not make any policy. The town makes the policy. First it goes to the Select Board and then it goes to town meeting. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Back to meeting format. Can there be some agreement that you would answer the questions posed to you by the public that very meeting versus waiting 30 days? Yeah, we, you the already. The select board, if, could you mirror the select board's format? We heard, you said that in the first time. Okay. So I, I, well, let I didn't us. Well, I an answer, so I didn't know. Is it back to what, we, 30 okay, days? Okay, so. Give an answer. All right, I'm going to answer. Can I answer her now well, or I, no? I would just like a clarification. Okay. If. She's asking you to answer questions that are thrown at you during public comment. The answer is no, you can't. Right. If you have a presentation and they have questions, then yes, you can. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. So, for example, when we had Scott McCarthy come in, he could answer questions. When we had Mike Spangnable come in, he, they could answer questions. Yes, because they're on and the agenda. Jack. Yeah. Yes, I'm 
talking public, to you. Public comment I'm is clarifying on your that agenda, but what is being spoken about in that public comment is unknown. So that... Right, but something on our agenda, like last time I talked about the specialized building code. Yeah. People ask questions, I answered. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah, okay. We need more There's chairs. There's some chairs up here. Yeah. We probably want to sit together. We're finishing up public comment, and we don't know if you have any comments to say. No comments, not right now. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. You see those two chairs? Yeah. All right. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Number six, approved minutes. So <clears throat> I move that we approve lock, stock, and barrel August 20, 2022 through August 2023 in one fell swoop. So I'm, I make a motion. How do you say that? I move that we approve those minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Then I uh, move that we approve last month, Og October's minutes. Yes? Yes. Yeah, second. second it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Okay. Aye. All right. So the next thing is updates. I'm first on the opt-in specialized stretch code. I don't really have any update right now. I talked to Chris Mason about coming to our next meeting and maybe doing a better presentation than I did last month and possibly being able to answer more questions than I could. I, he, he wants help. He, he's just learning about it too. So I'm, you know, we will follow up on that, but I'm not quite sure when yet. Get somebody good in here to talk about it. So next is solar on the landfill. Yes. Um, I was in contact with the town administrator, Carolyn Brenner, and um, apparently there has been some initial conversations about putting solar on the dump uh, to do some preliminary study on it. Um, she recalled a meeting with Eversource and um, David Phil when he was uh, on the select board, um, they met with Eversource and were going to pursue uh, looking at putting solar on the dump. And so um, I put in a couple calls to her this week to follow up because she was going to talk to Eversource and find out where they were at. And I, and I have not heard back from her. So the project would, like instead of Next Amp or one of those, it would be an Eversource that, that project? That didn't quite make sense to me. I, I, I think Eversource, usually you bring in the installer and then their engineers talk to, to Eversource. Eversource and Eversource tells you what it would take to bring solar and bring the proper lines and the proper transformers to the site. And then you figure out how much that's going to cost. Um, so you still so need I don't to find out from Carolyn I, whether she, she's she talked to She's fuzzy. She's got a lot on her plate, yeah. and she, she d was fuzzy about what had actually been done. I actually was thinking about giving David Phil a call and seeing what, what his recollection is, because he was a proponent of it. and um, Find out if they contacted him, yeah. anybody. Yeah. So I'm still on it. Yeah. I just don't have a lot of new information, because I haven't been, nobody's gotten back to me yet. And please check on the stability of the surface. Oh, absolutely. That's, That's been a big concern, including in Amherst that yeah. held things up for a while. Yeah, there's a, there's special kinds of pilings that you s that that solar on on landfills sit on that are designed specifically not to puncture the the cap and you know, there's, right. there's special attachments that they they use in that situation. Um, so I was wondering if if we do this would it be that we would own the solar and could it be set up so that our municipal buildings, that's where, I know they wouldn't yeah. physically get their electricity from there, but they buy it at a cheap usually rate? Usually they get a fixed contract for the electricity. They can own it or another entity can own it. In, in the previous history, other entities have generally owned it because all of the incentives in, all of the subsidies for solar that are available 
were not available to nonprofits or to municipalities because you needed to have a tax burden in order to oh, get see. a tax credit in order, in order to take advantage of what is basically a 30% savings. On so the it didn't make any sense? It now makes sense because oh, those rules have now changed and now uh, under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, municipalities can in fact take advantage of that 30%. And so I they get like a 30% discount? They're going to get a chunk a of rebate cash or something no, they get from, cash back. from the a IRS. Cash. From the IRS. Even so though you don't pay taxes, they will give you so the amount of the rebate in cash. At 30%? Yes. 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 Sweet. Yes. And, and so then that, that makes it very affordable to do it um, and, and a good investment. And then so then the that town that would reap the entire benefit of it rather if than the town where the uh, that is correct it would be a less complicated ownership structure because in the past you had to create a, a, a shell game of lawyers had to create a shell game of ownership structures so that this person could take the tax credit and this person could get the electricity and the, this would be a simpler thing potentially where the town could just own it do it right and take the advantage of, of the election and however the disadvantage is if the town owns it the town pays up front that's what has to wait right so it costs us and then back. we also I don't know who maintains it, but... Well, and then there's maintenance. That's mm -hmm. another question. Well, so yeah. then the other part of my question is, all right, let's... Going with that idea, the town owns it. We get the 30% rebate on the cost of installing it. But then if our... If that electricity... S is there a way that our municipal buildings can get, like, a yeah. good... There, there's something called a, a, a Schedule Z that you fill out with the utility company when you have a big solar project and you designate who the extra electricity is going to. Now the electricity doesn't actually go to I the know, but it goes onto the grid, it gets measured, and as it's measured that credit goes to whoever you designate on that Schedule Z. In this case the town would designate the school or the library or whatever it was. That the so town it wouldn't be that the town would be buying electricity from that array we, it would be like you have it on your home and you get credit for generating that is so that it could conceivably save us a ton of money on potentially yeah i mean it depends how much it costs to run a three you know uh, three phase electricity to to the location and how many transformers you have to do i mean i yeah so. you may remember we had brian adams in brian lives in northampton he is just committing to his 54th <coughs> project, mostly in Northampton. But he's a private, he and his wife, private, they had some extra funds, so they put in some seed money, and they've been helping out the Senior Center in Northampton, the Food Bank, in some of these buildings in Northampton, lots of libraries. Unfortunately, he couldn't help you know with the senior center or anything like that because he has so much demand on this but it was some of those ideas because they needed sort of a a place to do the tax incentives and everything right. else his business model is kind of gone now because of these new regulations so he's right and yeah. he wasn't able to do anything yeah. for us i'm just wondering so i guess that's what we want to look at is which would be most cost effective for yeah, the town i think we're a long way off from that first we have to figure out like how much does it cost? And then we can, we would figure is, is out it the best business Is it financially small. feasible? Is it significantly less expensive than buying electricity off, 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 you know, off the grid? And if it is, then, then we figure out you know, who, who would own it and what makes the most sense and how would it be financed? Um, and if it can't be financed by the town, then you, and maybe you bring in somebody like that who has the cash, but they're going to make, they're going to make some of the profit instead of the town making all the profit at that point. But those are all, things to consider down the line. Well, there's also the fact that, like Jack and I went to, um, what's it called, Unpacking Massachusetts Climate Action Plan at Hampshire College the other night. And this man, Stephen Roof, was talking. And he showed, I think we should have him, that's the next topic is public speakers. But anyway, one of the things he pointed out is that really soon, every, all over the state we need to a lot more solar so we sort of have a responsibility for it. that's disturbed land it's kind of a perfect place to put a solar array well and again you have to look at the foundation of this all because it can't be put on unstable ground more and that's a real concern and cost and yep. as well as cost 
You want another one? Just in case. Okay. Okay, so I guess that's all for that. Um, Jack? So, Levy, we've had an opportunity to talk with Carolyn Brennan and, you know, what seemed like a small scale item at first. It's just really hard to get answers. It's, there are at least a couple of options for the town. Um, they all involve between 25 and 65 million dollars. I think it's very much up in the air. She is hoping that by this winter they'll actually have more answers and they might be able to do some public forum. You mean it. like for funding? Well, no, just to tell people what they're considering and then look at funding sources. It just, it's a very complicated issue, for sure. Okay. Uh, for zoning for solar, I know that had come up at a past meeting. Please just check the zoning and planning board guidelines. You'll find all that information <coughs> there. Um, and that will give you a little more insight. But, you know, I'm sort of sad. There was someone in particular I wanted them to hear this about what Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed has come out with in the last two months. If you're not aware, and I teach eighth graders science at a public school in Massachusetts, they give every public school teacher a list of state standards. So in my particular case, I'm responsible for about 25 standards over the course of the year. The state has a 2006 version, they have a 2016 version, and recently, as of August, they came out with instructional guidelines for grades six to eight in science. And here are things that they are including. They are really having us focus on evidence, reasoning, and modeling, math and data, and investigations and questioning, and they're really having us work with kids around back up your claim with evidence. And what they say is your students will be able to explain the, um, both based on evidence obtained in investigations and currently accepted theories and practice, use evidence of changes in atmospheric carbon cycles, fossil fuel use, large-scale global, uh, large-scale deforestation, to construct an explanation of how human activities have resulted in the rise of global temperatures over the past century. This is state law. This is the mandate coming into all middle school science teachers. And hang on, let me find the other one because this is also relevant to the work that we're doing. It's on page 12, right here. Okay, so under the category um, eighth grade, middle school, earth, um, and space science. Examine and interpret data to describe the role that human activities have played in causing the rise in global temperatures over the past century. It's the state law. This is what teachers have to do. This isn't something debatable. This is what we're handed by our principals, our bosses, and told to teach it because the kids will be assessed on whether or not they know this. Our students need to be able to construct explanations about how fossil fuels and minerals were formed over time and construct an explanation for how extracting, refining, and using fossil fuels or minerals can have a negative impact on the environment and human health, causing more carbon dioxide in the air, which is a primary cause of climate change, causing more particulates in the air, which contributes to asthma and other respiratory conditions, and causing more toxic chemicals to enter water sources. Your students will need to be able to analyze situations to identify ways to increase or decrease human impact on the environment, such as using renewable energy resources, carpooling, taking tr public transportation, <coughs> reducing storm water runoff, reducing food waste, and recycling. And construct an argument based on evidence that human activities such as deforestation, the use of fossil fuels, cause environmental changes, including a global rise in temperature and increased flooding. So, you know, this is, this is the state law for public school teachers. Um, and it's interesting to sort of see the evolution over time. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so our next topic is, we've been talking for a while about putting together speaker series. 
Anybody have any suggestions? <coughs> it would be like public. Join with the library, maybe Hadley Learns. I think we should do one like the one I heard the other night at at the Hitchcock Center about the Massachusetts Climate Action Plan and it breaks it did a really nice job of the state also has it's called the decarbonization roadmap for benchmarks for 2025 2030 and 2050 it's got some really nice graphics to go with it and not s overwhelming amount of detail but it really gives you a good idea of like Okay. Does the state have a speaker series that we can tap into it? Not that I know of. They might. They've got a lot of paperwork on it. Is, it, is the person from the Hitchcock Center available? They're from Hampshire College. Yeah, he teaches at Hampshire. Um, I, I might get in touch with him. Hopefully. He was willing to speak at the Hitchcock Center, so maybe he will do that for us or if he doesn't want to he might know somebody else he teaches environmental studies and What's his name? Stephen Root Roof yeah. R O O F yeah. uh, one thing I'd suggest is some sort of speaker series aimed specifically at farmers I think there's a real need I think these last few years have been absolutely wild between droughts that were unimaginable and then floods that are unbelievable so what are you thinking? Like somebody ate farmers to speak or somebody to talk about? I think we can ask some farmers to be willing to speak. You know, how is this impacting them? I can't imagine from year to year having to rethink your operating system because you have no idea what the weather is going to be like. Okay. Would that be helpful? Most farmers are boring speakers. Well, I'm just wondering, <laughs> would it be helpful to have like a forum where you get to, you know, oh, woe is me, yeah. or would it be helpful to have farmers come talk about stuff they're doing to help? That would be more helpful. That's what I'm thinking. Like you're u using no-till or, you know, mm -hmm. or people building mounds now and like better, more drainage, yes. you so know, like, I don't know. So I heard the... Um, person who's in charge of the Western Mass Food Bank when the Kestrel Trust gave them that land up in Amherst Hadley. Yeah. He might be a good speaker. Who and is this Andrew now? Andrew Morehouse? Yes. Okay. What's his name? Andrew Morehouse. And what's he? He's from Kestrel? No, no, no. no he, he's well, from he's from Western, the Food Bank of Western, Western Mass. The Food Bank of Western Is he a Mass. farmer? No. No, he's no. a manager. But he might know some people. Who or he can talk. speak. Yes. But does he... I'm just thinking about things that would help the farmers. This would help the farmers. Okay, and he's from the food bank? Yes. I, I think we, what Wally was saying, just having some farmers come in and talk about what they're doing. What they're doing. Might be just like local, like you guys. And, you well, know. and you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who, which of, Ellen? yeah. I wonder if there would be like a way for, yeah, like to talk about it and like not like um, technical, not too technical, but just thinking like, Hey, we're a big part of this community, and we get a lot of support from people eating here as well. And just to kind of go back and forth about um, how we're all experiencing the weather together, and then we can like look at it through farming. It's a very um, approachable lens. Okay. That, that's what I'm thinking. Like not too formal, just yeah. y you know. Is that something she's willing to put together? Does she know enough farmers to do that? Would you be willing to help us? Do you know enough farmers to um, help us? Sure. Yeah, Amanda would help me. Put that together? I'm Amanda. I also live in Hadley at 22 Sylvia Heights. I'm working with some of the farmers on the valley. Um, all of them are fighting climate change on different levels. One of those farmers lost their entire summer crop to record floods in the nor in the Florence Northampton area. Yeah. So. Um, we know between the two of us several farmers across different parts of Western Mass that would be willing to speak about the various Perfect. In adaptations, but also like uh, increasing levels of uncertainty that it's uh, introducing into our food system. So afterward, I'll give you my email and you guys can... 
See, yeah, this is part of the challenge what too about? of setting up the rules and you know different people sharing at certain times. I'm wondering, Steve, would you have anything to share on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. We've been around quite a while and we've adapted. Yeah. Well, and I think De Denise Mann's Barstow. Yeah. yeah. She's dead. Yeah, she's quite an expert on this too, and you know everything they do with the. Um, what is that machine called? Yeah. Uh, those, I yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So wait, what, what is your name? I'm sorry. Yeah. Stephen Vine. Okay. So. Stephen what? Divine. Yeah. So afterwards, I'll give you. Uh, can I get your email so we can kind of. Yeah. Be in touch about when when we're going to do this. Wally, what about you? Would you like to be in on it? Oh, I'll listen. Do you know, <laughs> this is a stupid question, do you know any other farmers that... <laughs> yeah, I know Steve Devine. <laughs> well, I know you know every Let farmer around Let here. Let it go. Okay. All right. Okay. And Michael. So if anybody else has yeah. suggestions for farmers for us Michael. to get... Michael, Michael. Michael. Michael, how about you? Well, I'm a retired farmer. But you, you know... still have farmers. resources. I, I bet you can remember a little bit about it. Uh, but another good he likes to talk. Who? Al Oh yeah. How do you spell that? Z U C H O W S K I. Wait, you lost me after C H. <laughs> Z U C H. He also does an interesting program on what the natives did. Oh, awesome. And he's a f what kind of farm? West Street. Lazy Acres Farm. What is it? Lazy Acres Farm. Lazy. <laughs> Is he a vegetable farmer, dairy? Yep. Good. Squash, some tobacco, a lot of different grains. I'm not sure if Alan grows tobacco. He does a little bit. Does he? He does. He's a lot of grains. Didn't know that. Okay. He has one strain Moving that he really likes. Hmm? Move on. Huh. Really likes. <laughs> no, it's getting carried away. Right. Okay. Well, I. I want to hear their ideas. So is that it on speakers? Do you have any ideas? I you know, I'll have to put some thought into it. Okay. Yeah, I, um... No, well, this is good. Yeah. yeah. We'll, I we'll think, think of more as we go along. I angle is really yeah. important for well, this. When I you think see the farm, farmer angle is a very important well, yeah. thing. Kathy, I think yes. the winter time. Susan will send my email. And I you have my email. Okay, great. Okay. Perfect. Right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so I think we're done with speaker series. And that brings us to adjourning the meeting. Do what about I have items not anticipated at time of posting? I don't have any. Okay, good. <laughs> Can I go back to the farmer discussion? Are you going to try and set a date for that now or next meeting or? No. Okay. Well, um, I, I would suggest that that might be something for a February, March timeline <coughs> ahead of the growing season. Yeah when people have some time to meet and talk and not okay. feel the pressure of the harvest or planting. So, but I'm thinking that it would be not at one of our meetings. It would be like a public forum type yeah. thing that we'd set up. So I will check in with Patrick Berezo and just see what the possibilities are for us to use that open front room. That's a great space. Mm -hmm. um, or here. Or, or here, here in the dining room. One or the yeah. other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but a large room, so as many yeah, farmers as want to come. Just to reiterate, what we're talking about is people sharing their experiences of what they what changes they've experienced. I think that would probably be the most and, helpful. And what and how what's, what adaptions adaptations. adaptations that they've made. Yeah. And um, what 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 do they suggest we do going forward? Yeah. To try to. To deal Adaptations with and mitigation. Yep. I think it would be interesting to get some educators. Could be. Yeah. To talk about what they're doing in the classrooms. About what? Clim this curriculum that's that is idea. being state mandated. How that's been. That could be a possible topic. Uh -huh. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, I think it's spontaneously good. Thought. Yeah, I think this is a big change for many teachers. 
having to figure out yeah. what exactly do they do or and it how could they be like it. a sharing yeah. kind of a curriculum day or something mm -hmm. a kind of sharing of ideas different teachers mm -hmm. maybe it could be like a and everybody probably would benefit from you know hearing some of what they're doing and yeah that's an excellent so idea. what would we call that i don't know educators forum climate change We'll keep thinking. Educators Forum. <coughs> we'll have a good name. So actually, I have an unanticipated item. Okay, well, that's number nine. We're good. So this is the kind of thing I get real excited about, and other people just go, yeah, okay. Um, I was in Staples not too long ago, and uh, anyway, one thing led to another, and one of the men that works there handed me uh, like a little poster of all the things that you can take there to be recycled. And, you know, most people know, like, printer toners and all that, anything, anything electronic, they will take it for free. The really cool new addition is plastic, any plastic writing utensil and markers are now recycled. Do not oh throw gosh. them in the trash. Staples will take them. That you don't have to have bought them there. No. No, I mean, I, I brought one of the posters over here and asked maybe you guys could set up a little basket with a <laughs> sign. And I mean, locker clean out at the end of the school year. I've already seen, talked to Annie McKenzie about it, and also the secretary at the Hadley, at the elementary school. Jennifer already had the notice up, but I highlighted that because, I mean, we're talking. When you think about all the pens and markers, I mean, just at my daughter's house for my two grandchildren, I mean, that would fill a trash can all there. No, as they, they have every kind of marker and pen and crayon you can imagine. Anyway, it's a lot of plastic that can't go in your recycling bin, but if you can just hold off and not... Collect them like batteries. <coughs> that's right. And then when you take your toner cartridge back, Take all your used up pins and markers. Good idea. Thank you. I had one other item to add um, just regarding s solar investigation. Um, when I spoke to, the, to Carolyn, she started talking to me about the solar on the library and potentially on, on, on this building. And so but with permission of the committee, I'd like to be authorized to just continue that investigation as well. This committee Please. is waiting to go, this building is waiting to go out to bid. We're ready, we have the money. Why are we waiting to go out to bid? Because the first time we went out to bid, we followed state rules, and the state rules had changed so that you didn't have to have cert DMC it's certification, now. and it's much easier now. Oh, I remember nobody would touch it because there were so many rules. Right. But now, now it's, it's just like a house. Or but a there's so many things going on that it hasn't been written yet. But because it's ready to go. It sounds like, with respect to the library and the roof issue, That's on tell hold. me if I'm wrong, it's over now because you guys decided that it doesn't make sense to fight with the engineers and to determine who's at fault and just going to put another roof on because it's cheaper than than the legal battle. That was my interpretation of my conversation. My last hearing was the library's on hold. Oh my God. Whether it's waiting for a new roof or whatever. It can't go on with the existing roof. A absolutely. But that that roof issue is resolved now at this point. Okay, I at least there's that. a positive go forward okay. plan is what right. you're saying. Well, I haven't heard that, maybe. but okay. Maybe you guys could do All right, but back. It, I have it a does question. sound like this building's a go. Yes, yes. So but what? Wait on the, who wait for that puts one. out for the bid? Like physically, who does that? Jennifer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does this have a standing seam roof on yes, it? Yes, it does. Okay. So yeah. we're just waiting for her and to get to it. And it already has on. The, the whatever it chase the, racks? the chase into the panel. Great. We're ready. We built it for it. Okay. Way to go. So I wonder if there's any possibility, if we're getting a new roof on the library, if it would be... It's not cheaper to do them together because we're two different... No, 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 not do it together. I'm just wondering if we'd be better off with this kind of roof instead of... Yes. And that's yes, but that's, that's, that's a different question. That's the question. resolution to that roof, is to put this kind of roof on that roof, because they never should have put that roof on that thing in the first place. 
Well, we tried. Because have Gene watching the thing go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think now at 8 o'clock we can anyway, say yes, this meeting is adjourned. Yes. Anybody second. Second?